And now, it's time for another Dice Tower Review with Tom Vassell. Hey folks, today we're taking a look at Tigris and Euphrates. Now this is obviously not a new game. came out, I believe, originally in 98 or 99. Tigers and Euphrates is a game by Rana Canizia. This is the new reprint of this game from Fantasy Flight. You've never heard of Tigers and Euphrates before? Well, I must say that if you haven't, you should certainly look into it. I believe it is the most unique game that he's ever designed, and there's very few games that are like it. It's very interesting. It's very combative. Um, there's uh, certainly some interesting... It's a tile-laying game. There's some concepts in the game, like the lowest number of points and the different color wins that have been taken and used in other games, but still, no other game has really come close to how this one plays. Let me show you. In this game, you're going to have these temples that start in different spots on the board. Each temple has a little treasure on it. And there are four different color resources that you will be getting throughout the course of the game. Um, I forget what each of them are. They're red, blue, green, and black. At the end of the game, you're going to count however many resources you have in each of the colors. And whichever color you have the least of, let's say I have 10 green, 10 black, 10 blue, and 5 red, then my score would be 5. It's equal to whatever you have the least of. These little treasures here are wilds, and you can add them to anything at the end of the game. So how do you go about getting points? Each player is going to have four leaders of their color. The black guy is the king, this one's the priest, the trader, or, and the farmer, or something like that. Blue, green, black, and red. The, the black and green have special powers, but for the most part, you, they're just different colors and different symbols, and so you'll see here different symbols for the different players. On your turn, you have two actions. One of these actions can be placing one of your leaders out. A leader must always go next to a temple. That's a red tile on the board. When you place a leader next to a tile, that tile becomes a kingdom. And you can have multiple uh, leaders in one kingdom. In fact, you can have leaders from different groups in the same kingdom. You can also play tiles. Each player is going to have a shield that they're going to have. And behind that, they're going to have six tiles. And they can place a tile out as an action. And that can build kingdoms. And they can place tiles out basically as they want. Except these blue tiles can only be placed on rivers. And nothing else can be placed on river. Even a leader can't be placed on a river. So players have these two actions. You can place a leader, or you can place a tile, or you can discard up to six of the tiles behind your screen. You'll throw them out of the game and draw up to that many more tiles from the bag. Now, the way that that works, now that's the basic rules of the game. When you have a leader in a kingdom and you add a tile to that kingdom, Okay, I added a black tile to this kingdom. Neither one of these leaders is black, so nothing happens. But let's say I add a blue tile to this kingdom. I look, the blue leader is the player who is using the urns as their symbol. So that person is going to get one point. The king is a special leader in this regard. Let's say there's a king here. If I add a green tile to this kingdom, there is no green leader, so Normally, the green leader would get the point, but since there is no green leader, then whoever is the king in that kingdom, the black, will get the green point for me placing that out there. Now, if you happen to build four of the same color tiles next to each other, so let's say, for example, that I manage to get four in, in, in this kingdom here, and so I, I build and I get four black tiles next to each other. I'll turn those four tiles over like this, and then I can build a temple. Now I'm going to pick one of the black temples. There's a black red, black green, black blue. If I built four greens, I could also build the green red, or I could build the black green. Each temple is two colors. And I can put that temple here. And the way a temple works is at the end of your turn, if you have a leader in a region or a kingdom that has a temple of that color, you'll get one automatically. So if I had in this kingdom here, for example, let's say I had both 
the green and the, um, the black and the red, the green leader, at the end of my turn I get an extra black and an extra green point. Temples give you points every turn, which makes them very powerful and very useful. Now, there can be multiple leaders of different uh, players in the same kingdom, but there can never be two leaders of the same color. If I decide that I'm going to, I want the king in this kingdom, and so I place it here, I'm the bow and arrow player, that causes a revolt, which is a conflict between the two players. Only one can survive. So what happens here is we compare the number of temples that they're next to. He's next to one, so he has a power of one. The, the, this guy here is next to two temples, so he has a power of two. The attacking player, the player who placed the newest one, is going to reveal as many red tiles as they want. That's what's used in a revolt. So let's say he reveals three. So now it's a power of four to two. The defending player reveals two. All the tiles that they reveal are thrown out of the game. It's a tie. Since it's a tie, the defender wins. If it's not a tie, then whoever has a higher number wins, obviously. When you lose, let's say, so this guy loses, he comes off the board, and the winning player gets one red point for winning that battle. So that's one way to take over someone's kingdom. Another way is, let's say there was a kingdom up here, um, and this kingdom, we, I have this tile here, and I connect this with a tile. Now when you connect two kingdoms together, first of all, the connection that you play here is going to basically, that tile doesn't count for anything, but now those two kingdoms are going to have a war. And we're going to look at the, there's two green leaders and there's two blue leaders. So they're going to have to fight. The person who connected them is going to decide the order that the fights happen. And when you fight in a kingdom, you're going to use the number of tiles in that kingdom that match your color. So here, blue has one blue in this kingdom, and in this kingdom, blue has zero. So it's zero to one. And instead of using red tiles to fight, you'll use blue tiles. And if the green players fight, again, he has one green tile, so it's one to zero. And they'll use green tiles to fight. The winner of this battle removes not only the loser, but also all the tiles of that loser's color and gains one point for each of those that they destroy. So a war can be very deadly and can score the winner a lot of points. And in fact, sometimes a war will cause uh, the kingdom to break up so that, uh, let's say the green leaders were fighting, maybe a piece broke off, now the black leaders don't have to fight or the blue leaders don't have to fight, whatever. So wars and revolts will happen based on how you place your leaders and or tiles. Finally, Players have a fourth thing that they can do for one of their actions, and each player starts the game with two catastrophe tiles. You can place these tiles out whenever you want. You can place them out maybe to destroy a kingdom. You can place them out um, to basically maybe destroy a temple, and if uh, a leader was next to that temple, then that leader is removed from the board. When you place leaders, you place them on the board, but you can also take a leader up off the board and move them somewhere else. So leaders, when you, you move a leader, can move anywhere. So those are your four actions. The last thing is when you connect two kingdoms together and there's a treasure on two of the different temples, then whoever controls the green leader, the, the merchant in, the, in that area, is going to take one of those and keep it behind their screen. And there's a rule that if it has this symbol around it, they take that one first, etc. So that is the game. There is some extra things that can be used if you have a kingdom and you build a line of three or more in that kingdom, then you can build like a great work here. And what that does is anytime I place a blue tile in this kingdom now, if there's a blue leader there, they will get two points rather than one. And this will stay here, this can't be destroyed, this area. However, if someone builds a longer line of blues, it will move over there. And there's one of those for each color. Also, if you build a cross, of all the same color. You could put out the wonder of the world here, which goes out on the board, and you put this on top of it, and whoever has a king connected to the wonder of the world can take one color of their choice each round. The game will go until players cannot draw any more tiles. At that point, scoring will happen like I told you earlier. Tigers and Euphrates and me have had kind of a love-hate relationship since I played it. I played it probably over 50 times since it's come out. I think the first game of it I hated. The second game of it I thought was pretty good. The third game of it I loved. The fourth game of it I hated it again. So it's kind of gone all over the place for me. I like it best with two players. 
One thing I do like about this new version is it has two sides of the board. One side has its advanced side. There's more river spots on it, so you can put more of the blue monuments out. There's a more, also more spots for temples and treasures. So that kind of shakes things up. Uh, and I should let's just talk real briefly before I get into Tigers and Euphrates as a whole uh, as to the, the components of this one. I think are a little bit... I, I actually think I like the original components better. I know it's odd for me to be saying, but I think I like the cubes more than these little tokens for the ones and fives. And I think I also like the wooden temples and pieces better than the new plastic stuff. It's not a big deal. I don't think it's big either way. I enjoy using these components and all. And the tiles in this game are certainly better quality than the original tiles. Um, so, but anyway, uh, the new additions to this one with the, the great works, these new buildings, they're nice. They're not necessary. I don't think they mess the game up. They're a small thing that something else to go for maybe to get, you know, if you control one of these and put out tiles, you're getting two points each time, which can be a big deal. The wonder of the world thing is, is neat. It's hard to pull off though. And probably not, not that big of a deal in the game. I, I don't know that I would use it very often. Tigers and Euphrates is an intriguing game. It really is because you only have two things you can do in your turn, and you're simply putting tiles out on the board. So first off, I'll put out a leader and a, a tile of that leader's color. My first turn, I get one black point. All right, great. Then on my next turn, I'm like, ooh, I'll take another point, and I'll go over here. And you start slowly, but eventually the you know, the, the kingdoms are going to combine. Or you, you'll see this very lucrative kingdom and you're like, man, I want that kingdom and it has a monument that's generating every turn. So I'm going to go for that, that conflict. Now in the original game, they were called internal and external conflicts. Here they're called revolts and wars, which makes more sense. Uh, it's also easier to explain to people. The wars are really where this game is deadly. You need to make a play at some point to win the game, or at least defend yourself against the play. And this is where my love-hate relationship with Tigers and Euphrates comes in. Because the there is a time where you might attack someone, and you have four blue to their one blue, and then you play two tiles. There you go, six to one. And they like just happen to have five blue tiles behind their screen. They win, and that can literally take you out of the game. Now that doesn't happen often, but I've seen it happen enough to know that it does happen. And when it happens to me, that makes me want to flip the table and throw the game around and jump on it because it's so irritating. Now, you need to prepare for that and maybe not put all your eggs in one basket. And I realize that and then I'll come back and go, yeah, I really do like the game. And then it happens to me again, I'm like, ah. So right now where I'm at, I'm liking the game at this point in time, I'm enjoying it. Uh, but I can see it. this is not a game for people who all want to get along. This is not a Euro game, I think, at all, really, because you're at each other's throats the whole time. You're trying to control. You want those green merchants so that you can get those treasures, those wild, those wild pieces. Those are great. You want to have the king, so you can, when you place a tile there, any color, you can get it. You want to control those monuments. Those monuments are big once they're out and you're watching what everyone else gets. They're putting points behind their shield, but if you're sitting there and on a turn, you control two monuments or whatever, and you get a red, a blue, a green, and a black, that's a big deal because I know that you've gotten one point that turn. No matter what your lowest color is, if you get one of every color on a turn, your lowest amount is going up. So it's interesting. I mean, if I see someone get six black, I'm like, yeah, no big deal. I don't care if you get 50 of the black. If you only have one red, your points are one. So you're kind of watching everybody and what they play and where they play it. And there's some argument whether you should just play with open points so everyone can see how much everybody has. Although I warn you, if you do that, the game will slow down to a crawl as players sit there and analyze everything. I do like that the game can end quickly by just people just swapping out their six tiles. So if you think you're winning, you can do that. Try to end the game. And games of Tigers and Euphrates rarely go over an hour once you know what you're doing. And they're very strategic. Like I said, there's no other game out there like it. I think it's an amazing game in the design category. I think it's, it's unique and it's interesting and it's probably his greatest game he's designed and from a pure looking at it, and I appreciate the design perspective. As for me, I don't know that I love the game. I like it. And of course, you know, ask me again in a couple months and maybe I'm hating it again. But I currently like it. That tile draw thing is the only problem I have with the game. Other than that, I think it's fascinating back and forth. I like the little small additions that Fantasy Flight added to it. If you've never played it before, I don't care who you are, I recommend you try it out at least once. Unless you hate conflict, at, in any degree, then maybe you shouldn't try this one out. Other than that, it's fascinating. Tigers and Euphrates. Dice Tower Judgment, approved.
Thanks so much for watching the Dice Tower videos. Find more great videos and reviews as well as our top-rated audio podcast at Dicetower.com. You can also find other great shows at Dicetowernetwork.com. I'm Eric Summerer, and you've been watching The Dice Tower. The Dice Tower is sponsored by Cool Stuff, Inc., where you can find great games for great prices. Cool stuff in stock. Check them out at CoolStuffInc.com. Shut the door! Yeah. Yeah.